started. I'm, I'm excited to hear more about Otzi. Um, so the first time that I heard about it was last year at ApacheCon. And um, yeah, it's a cool project that uh, works straight with uh, Apache HTTP UD. And so uh, it's nice to see some uh, that sort of foundational integration. So um, I'll kick it over to you, Ocean, and um, ask some questions at the end. Uh, thanks again. All right. OK, so um, this is the second talk about Atsi. The last one was last year, like everybody said before. And uh, I'm not going to go through all the details of Atsi per se. I'm just going to go through uh, exploring basically a, a, an applied solution and showing how Atsi is used to put together, which is, which is more interesting than the previous talk, because that was just theory, basically. So let's start. Uh, this is the subject today, is enabling Mars exploration with ATSE. Um, ATSE is Apache HTTPD Tile Serving Ecosystem. It's really just an acronym, um, and it's one that's not used anywhere else. If you search for ATSE, this is what you find. That was the basis on which it was chosen. Um, it's really a collection. It's, a, it's an Apache HTTPD extension. It's the best way to look at it. It's a bunch of modules for tile map serving, it kind of stretches into image processing. It, it does a, a lot of uh, interesting stuff that I haven't seen anywhere else, which is basically why I had to go and write them myself. And um, again, the talk is a practical example of how to use these modules to build an, an Apache HTTPD server for tile serving, in this case, for uh, the Mars maps, which is a live server supported by Esri called astroesri.com. The outline of the talk, I'm going to update a little bit on the ATSE and uh, what the updates are and what the current status is. The, and then I'm going to talk about the, the server itself, the astro.esri.com data sets and what is it for. Then we're going to dive a little bit deeper into ATSE modules configuration and how they are used to configure the Mars high rise image mosaic, which is a massive, massive data set. And then um, basically, the last piece, if I get to it, is changing the configuration to add color because it's grayscale by default. So let's start. Again, ATSE is a collection of HTTP modules that share a common tile request pattern. Uh, by doing this, you, they can communicate between themselves and you can build a, it's like a puzzle. You can pick and choose what you want to do, stack them up, uh, establish data flow, and then produce the output that you want. The pattern itself is whatever the URL is, and ends in tile MLRC, where LRC are level row column. It's the classic pyramid scheme. Ooh, that sounds kind of weird. Um, but yes, it's a pyramid scheme for addressing uh, a binary tile grid for uh, mapping. And M is a optional multipurpose uh, extra dimension that you can map to one or more dimensions any way you want. It's just a selector, basically. Um, it's open source. It's C, C++, Apache version 2 license. Um, it's on GitHub if you look for the URL above. Um, or if you just Google Atze, you'll find it. Um, that's the easiest way. Again, uh, it, you can combine them. You can combine them within the same server, which makes it nice because it's integrated. It's a single point. Um, it does all the stuff inside a single Apache. Or it's also very suitable for splitting them up and establishing them as microservices and stacking them using something like uh, Kubernetes so to, to establish the connections between them and scale them that way if you want to. Performance is slightly different because it's no longer integrated in the same memory space in HTTPD, but now there's networking code involved with Kubernetes uh, managing everything. Uh, but it lets you pick and choose, you can, you can do data intensive um, services in one instance and compute intensive instances in a different instance, or you can scale it differently. It's basically, it's, it's just, you can design anything you want. Um, internally, it's using the Apache HTTPD sub request mechanism to communicate. This is when a request gets made, but internally the handler decides to issue a different request and see what would happen if that request would, would happen. Um, and you can actually 
fulfill that request and get the, the content back and then do something with it. So that's how the communication between modules is done. Um, the, the communication between machines is done through mod proxy, which is the standard proxying module in Apache. Um, so it's not part of Atze. It's uh, the concept here is to just write the pieces that I need and are missing from HTTP, not to rewrite a whole geo server or uh, or a GIS server. Um, Atze consists of a bunch of pieces. Um, it basically starts with shared code, which is used to be libatze and libicd, which stands for image codex. Um, then it has source modules, which are MRF, which is uh, my own format, it's in GDAL. It's a really powerful format for um, basically tiles. It's a it's a tile store, or you can use it just as a as a raster format or an array format. Uh, eCache is the Esri um, bundle cache, which is the my employer, I guess, um, and it's it's separated in multiple files and it's got its own advantages or disadvantages. Um, those are the the two source data. Um, external sources, basically. <clears throat> then uh, the core is operational modules. And these are things like retile, convert, fill in, uh, PNG mod, and there's a couple more, I think. And then there's utilities, which are not exactly outside. They're more generic pieces of code. Uh, they're also modules, Apache modules, and they can be used for anything else, uh, not necessarily within outside. Things like receive, which actually issues a sub request and receives the content for further use. Send file if match, which is basically a regex with some fancy um, MIME types uh, functionality in it. Tile WMS, which is a protocol conversion between WMS and a tile, uh, the, the I'd say tile pattern. Uh, Brunsley, which is an image extension, a JPEG uh, packer. And then a language, uh, mod Lua, which lets you extend Atze in Lua if you don't want to dive deep into the CC++ to write the missing code that you need. Um, changes from last year, LibAtze was mentioned last year. It evolved, it got bigger, uh, and it got split into two pieces. One is an HTTPD dependent code, which is really a module because you can only use it within HTTPD. And the other one is the raster codex library which is a standard shared library, and you can use it for um, any uh, project you want. Mod Bronsley is a new one. I mentioned this before. It's, it's actually quite brilliant. It's a um, lossless JPEG uh, repacking library uh, from Google. It, the output is 22% smaller than uh, JFIF, which is the JPEG file interchange format, I think, which is the standard JPEG that everybody calls JPEG. Um, and it's, it's a lossless um, repacking. So you can actually pack it into a smaller space and then unpack it back to the original JFIF, which can be used and piped into the legacy um, applications without any changes, which makes it really easy to retrofit. Um, it is part of the JPEG Excel upcoming format, um, which is about to be standardized. The Mod Brunsley is an HTTPD codec filter. So it works like uh, GZIP in Apache HTTPD. You can just say, you can use mod filter to configure it based on type or based on flags or anything you want. And it does on the fly conversion between the Brunsley format and the JFIF, shrinking the data basically. Uh, it is pretty fast. It's uh, basically equivalent to JPEG more or less. Um, so it's in the millisecond range for the normal tile sizes, which are 256 by 256 or 512 by 512 most of the time. Um, and then the new part is an Atze top project, which has been beefed up a little bit and contains scripts to build Atze and GDAL with MRF on AWS. Ooh, that's a typo. AWS Linux 2 instances, um, because that would give that gives you a ready to go development or even a deployment system. Um, it's actually more of a development because it's got compilers and everything else. So it builds them from the Git sources directly. You can take this and modify it for any Linux flavor you want or make it part of a, of a Docker to build a container, for example, um, automatically. It's, I'm testing it both on the ARM64 and uh, x86 architectures. Um, there was a talk before about let's adopt ARM. I tried it and it works fine, so why not? I'm, I'm, I'm testing on both architectures. So this is actually the best way to start exploring if, if this talk uh, intrigues you. 
You can build this, look at the scripts, modify them. They're all ready to go. Um, it's just very simple scripts. It kind of shows you how to get it done and simplify some of the uh, dependencies. All right, so now let's get into Mars. Um, there's a site called astrorjs.com. The intention was to add other planets. Right now it all has Mars, even though it has some moon stuff in the background. It is part of the Esri Living Atlas, which is the group that, the bigger group that um, I work for. It hosts some very large Mars data sets in cloud format. These are not scientific data. These are basically visualization data. Uh, so they're not, NASA's not, as interested in them as, uh, as they concentrate mostly on scientific data. So these are um, further downstream products which are ready to use in uh, visualizations, not the data, but they serve a very interesting purpose, which is you can just go explore. So anywhere in the world, you can just pop up a browser and go take a look. Um, the goal for this was basically to establish a technology development platform and prototype strange technologies because Mars is kind of not a, a high uh, interest uh, target. Like if you would do, you, you can't really do that much prototyping for Earth, which you know, is because once you establish a service, it gets used by the clients and then we have to keep it up and do not change it. Um, the main goal here was to uh, provide base map services for Mars mapping. Um, traditionally, other planets other than Earth are not very well supported, including in RGIS. So it's a chicken and egg problem. You ask for development, but there's no data sets or there's data sets, but there's no software that can use it. So I decided to buy the bullet and start by providing base maps and data sets. Um, and then the secondary purpose is to step to simplify general public access. These are cloud services. They use the standard binary grids so you can connect to them. Um, you can use them through RGS REST. You can use them through web streaming support via GWMS driver. And there's also a, it, this is also the main server for open space, which has got its own URL. It's a NASA funded um, observatory, planetary observatory, uh, star observatory um, software that works with multiple computers, multiple projectors. It works across the country over the internet for shared uh, exploration of data sets and um, other planets. So it, it's basically providing support for that project. All right, so the data sets. Um, again, it holds some of the biggest Mars data sets that I know of. Um, it, for imagery, we have the MRO context camera, which uh, CTX is the well-known abbreviation of it. It's a mosaic, it's built by Caltech Murray Lab. It's a blended so it's fairly uniform grayscale five meter resolution global coverage but it's uncontrolled so the the exact position of the features is not accurate because of course there's not that much ground truth on earth that on uh, mars that allows you to actually have a, a ground truth controlled um, mosaicing process um, hrsc mola terrain is a blended uh, terrain DM um, from two instruments. One is MOLA, which is a laser altimeter. The other one is a high resolution stereo camera, uh, which can be uh, converted back to terrain. And these, this is a, a merge uh, data set that is used for providing terrain for 3D representations. Um, the big gorilla here is the high rise, uh, which is high resolution imaging science experiment camera image assembly. Um, this mosaic was built basically um, between ESRI and USGS Flagstaff as a collaboration, was built in 2018, early 2019, from 50 terabyte of lossless JPEG to K. Um, you can imagine how much data that is. We never unpacked it from JPEG to K, so I, I don't know how big it is uncompressed. Um, the result, again, was built for images, so it's converted down to lossy JPEG, but it's 12-bit because we wanted to keep the original 10-bit range. Um, and it's a uh, quarter meter resolution on the ground, uh, unprojected, so it's lat long on Mars. 80 million pixel by 40 million pixel. I think I did the math and that is like 3.14, so it's almost pi um, exabytes, exapixels. 
Um, so it's enormous. Even in JPEG 12, lossy uh, with a zero mask, which is the Z Zen mask is a, is a JPEG extension that holds the zero constant, so it can be used for transparency. It's, uh, it's about 20 terabytes, so it's huge. It's stored in MRF format, as a, which is normally a single file, but in this case, because it's so big, 20 terabytes, uh, we had to split it into eight uh, hemispheric quarters, so it's 90 by 90 degrees, uh, mostly because we wanted to load it on AWS S3, which has a five terabyte size limit. Um, and then there's some other data sets, um, high-rise local scene assembly. This is imagery and terrain from the 25 centimeter resolution uh, images, so it's matching terrain and image at very high resolution. The, the MOLA terrain is, um, I think it's 100 meters, um, whereas this one goes down to one meter, but it's very, very um, few spots on Mars, which are the high interest for NASA. Um, they took stereo images at quarter meter multiple times and produced terrain. So that's really nice if you want to visualize a local data set, like the landing spots for the rovers, for example. Um, so let me show you how it looks. Just to, if you go to um, astroarcgis.com, it takes you to this page, which has the Astro Group um, content, and it shows the CTX, which is the five meter. It has the high rise, which is the quarter meter. Um, has terrain, which you can't really. This one terrain. Um, and then the best way to see it is this uh, imagery and nomenclature map, which you can open. Should load pretty fast. And as you zoom in, so this is MDIM, it's a Viking data set, it's a very small data set, uh, colorized. Then as you zoom in, at some point, uh, this is the, what, the five meter. Um, CTX data set, which is global five meters, so it's it's fairly big. This is itself is about one terabyte in JPEG, if I remember right. This is eight bit classic JPEG, and these stripes are uh, a high rise colorized. Uh, my computer has been changed. If you if you try this, you will see grayscale, um, but um, this is high rise, so this is uh, quarter meter. So if I keep zooming, I actually get to see basically rocks the size of a car easily. So uh, it's, it's extremely high resolution. And you can see this in 3D. There's also this application called explorermars.sg.com, which is really the big success story because I established this server in 2019 and in 2020, Esri put some effort and provided explicit support for Mars in their 3D viewer. So now you can actually see the same data sets in 3D, and this is really 3D if you wait long enough um, and load the terrain. And it's in, it's in 3D, and then same as before, once you zoom in, the CTX will start to come in. It, it's slower because it, it does the 3D projection and it has to fetch a lot more tiles to make sure that there's no areas uh, that are not updated. But you can see this is in 3D, and if you zoom in some more, and if you're lucky, you can see some of the, this is much slower, so I'm not gonna dwell on it too much. I'm actually in, back in Romania and server is in Seattle, so uh, it takes a while for the data to show up. Plus this is my, my development server, it's not a standard server. And I'm gonna explain why that it would make it slower. Any case, so now let's get into the meat of the presentation, which is how is this done server side using ATSE? Um, Module configuration. So these are Apache HTTPD modules and they need to be configured so that they know what to do and what data to use and all that stuff. Um, I decided when I built out that um, I can't put everything into Apache HTTPD directives because that would create a lot of um, configuration directives and it would, it would just pollute the, the namespace of the Apache control files. So I split it into two, basically there is the Apache the classic HTTPD configuration, which controls only the module connectivity and access. So it, it basically says on this regex, uh, this module activates and it tells you in case it's an operation module, it tells you where that module is getting the data from. So you can actually trace the data flow within the Apache um, 
control files. Then there are separate files for ADSA configuration, which contains the raster info and, the, and then module specific directives. Things like the size, the tile size, the data type, the projection of the data, tile format, various format parameters, um, empty tile, which is the tile that gets sent when there's no data in the, in the, in the store, uh, e-tag for cache control on the client side, and then, of course, module-specific information and controls. Um, so this is, this is going to help you understand the next few slides. Um, operation modules take multiple configurations, so they take uh, both an input and an output. So the output is basically how the module presents the tiles to the user. The inputs are where does the source data come from, and both of them contain a raster, right? So in some cases, it can change the raster, so it reads the, how the raster looks on input, how the raster looks on output, and based on that, it figures out how to do the, the geometry transformation or the, the geography transformation. All right, so high res. As I said before, it's a truly uh, enormous data set. It's also uncontrolled, it's very sparse. So this is quarter meter global Mars in unprojected, so it's lat long. Um, it covers about three to 4%. It's basically the data set from high rise that was uh, existent in 2019 early. Um, it's been accumulating since, but we haven't redid the mosaic. So this is still the old mosaic. This is enormous. This is 20 terabyte in JPEG format. It's 12 bits. So um, this is basically the ATSA configuration. We're going to go through the ATSA, ATSA configuration um, itself, and then we'll show how Apache configuration puts the modules together to establish the data. So this is basically the first. It's, it's the stuff that accesses the data from S3. So um, again, we split the file into 90 by 90 degree uh, files. And this is telling this, the module that there's eight data files that are located on this path on this server. So it knows how to make a request, a range request to that file to get the right tile. And then that path is actually proxied to S3, which is where the data really resides. So the, the server itself doesn't have 20 terabytes of disk space. That's for sure. The data is on S3. And these two numbers are offset and size. So the size is always four terabytes, if I remember right, at offsets that are multiples of four terabytes. And that tells it that when it sees an index that's, let's say, 12 terabyte plus something, it goes down this list and says, oh, it's got to be in this file. So then it makes the range request from that file after it subtracts the 12 terabyte offset. Um, and that way you can actually take an MRF file that's 20 terabytes, which would be a single file normally, and split it into pieces and then offset them at different virtual offsets in this index. Uh, the index itself is basically a, per tile, it's an offset and a size for that respective blob chunk of data. Um, it takes 16 bytes per tile. And in this case, because the mosaic is so big, it would take about 280 gigabytes. And that file has to reside on the local disk for uh, speed of access. Uh, that's obviously not allowable. So there's another feature that, that um, takes an index and, and makes it more compact by stripping out the empty space where there is no data. Um, this is what this flag tells it to do, is use this file. In this case, it works very well because the data set is very, very sparse. As I said, it's only about 3% that has data. So it goes down from about 300 gigabytes to eight gigabytes. Uh, and then the top is things like the size. So again, it's 80 million pixels by 40 million pixels. It's grayscale, the page size, tile size is 5 by 5 12, and it's uh, unsigned integer 16, by 16 bits. Uh, the data itself has a range of 10 bits, so it has to use 16 bit uh, data type. And then empty tile, which is just a JPEG that basically says, use this tile when there's no data because there's no data. So this is just an empty JPEG with the masks that says there's no data here. Um, so this is, this is how it connects to S3 and how it pulls the data. The problem is for browser use, I can't use 10-bit JPEGs because the browsers can't support 10-bit JPEGs and neither do most of the other software packages. So you need to convert it, scale it down to 8-bit. Um, to do that, you use mod convert, which works per tile. So it takes a single tile, 
of input for a tile of output. It does a full decode and code, so it has access to the um, pixel matrix array, and it can do operations on it. It can change the data itself, and it can change the raster format, so the input can be um, you know, JPEG and the output can be PNG or vice versa. Um, for 8-bit value, by default, output tiles are JPEGs if there's no transparency, or PNG if there is. Um, this is what most browsers support, so this is bottom dango franca for everything um, on the web. Um, it uses it does value conversions via a lookup table interpolated linearly between points. Um, it's a it's a lookup table, and by default zero is transparent. So the format the the configuration is very simple. First, you have the same data, which is what's the e tag seed for cache control size of the data. It's exactly the same as the input. This has to be the same because it it op, it does a tile to tile. It does not change the size of the tile. It does not change the the geometry of the pixels or the tiles themselves. Um, that type is byte. This is for the output. Uh, it skips the top level. That's for compatibility with um, WMTS standard. And then the lookup table that says zero goes to zero. So zero on output goes to zero on the out. Zero on the input goes to zero on the output. One on the input goes to one on the output. And 1023, which is the maximum value for 10 bit, goes to 255, which is the maximum value for 8 bit. So it's basically just a, just a, 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 a what do you call it, a squashing of the, of, the, of the bit range, right? It goes from 0 to 1023 to 0 to 255. Uh, zero has to be specifically uh, separated because it is transparent. So if I would have, have 0, 0 and 1023 to 55, then values between zero and four or zero and three would map to zero, which would make them transparent, but they're not. Zero is transparent on the input, has to be one-to-one -one translated to output. Um, okay, so now we got it done. We got output that's JPEG or PNG, so the browser will understand it, but it's on this grid that's 80 million pixels by 40 million pixels with a 512 tile size. The problem is most um, viewers expect a binary grid. So everything has to be a power of two and 80 and 40 are not a power of two. There's a five, a factor of five in there. So they're not aligned with the standard well-known grids um, for Earth or for Mars in this case. So to make it simpler, you need to scale it back and retile it basically. For that, you use mod retile, which produces a binary grid aligned tile data set. Um, it, this module, mod retiled, does actually projector conversion. It does, same as the mod convert, it does a full decode and code, so it operates on pixels, but it can use many input tiles to generate a single output tile. So because of that, it can actually change the, it can recut the grid or scale it. It supports uh, conversions between the most common projections. These are uh, separable uh, conversions, which makes them really, really fast. It supports GCS, uh, it supports Mercator, the true Mercator, the WGS84 based one, and it supports the web Mercator, which is the spherical Mercator. Um, it also supports whatever it is if you don't need to change the projection, if you just want to scale it and align it to a different grid, that's by default, it doesn't need to know the projection, as in this case, right? So this data is, is GCS is basically unprojected, but it doesn't need to, to know because it doesn't change the projection, it just scales it. So this one says, and you can actually see what I'm doing here. So I'm, I'm going from 80 megabytes to 128 megabytes, which is a power of two. And then from uh, 40 megabytes to 64 megabytes, which is again, a power of two. And I'm using 512 by 512 tiles. So this way it's a, it's a binary grid that's fully compatible with most viewers. Um, I wanna say that the output format is image PNG and that will become apparent to the next step why that is needed. Uh, and I wanna say that transparency is on for zero is by default, and then nearest is on. Um, this module has controls when it does um, conversion between Mercator or Web Mercator and GCS, the quality depends on which input level it's using from to produce a certain level on the output. Um, so it, it's got more controls than I'm showing here that says you can use a, a, a deeper level to produce higher resolution, but the penalty is that you're gonna use more input, which takes time to collect and decode. 
and of course it in, in increases the memory footprint while processing. So it's a trade-off. You trade quality for image quality, for uh, shorter latencies and um, performance scalability. All right, so that actually works. Everything works. There's no problem. But we still have a, one small problem, which is uh, for a single user, this is fine. I can try the server. It's pretty performant. The uh, retail is actually very, very fast because the conversions are done hand optimized. They're separable, so they're, it does the x axis and the y axis separately, which makes them linear, not powers of two. <clears throat> the problem is now if I deploy it on Amazon on a cloud server, it's fine for a single user, but if there's many users, it has to scale. And some of the operations, like the retiling, takes a little bit of CPU. The Astro server works in bursts. Most of the time, it doesn't do anything. There's very few users that are connected to it at any point in time. But once in a while, you get something like the Rose Planetarium in New York, which has seven projectors. And each projector is, I think it's a 4K or a 2K projector. And they're all synchronized. They all uh, combine the output to produce a a spherical uh, image on the observatory ceiling. Um, that session, when that those seven machines plus the control machine is running, is going to request a bunch of tiles all at the same time. Um, so at that point, the CPU becomes uh, the bottleneck. So you would need more CPU. S3 scales, but the CPU doesn't. You have to budget for it. The problem is if I choose a big machine, then it's expensive because most of the time it doesn't do anything. This happens like once every week or once every two weeks, depending on how active uh, the community is, the user community is. The solution is to do tile caching on the local SSD drive of the server machine on the fly from the output of the previous module. So all the input modules happen. I take the 10-bit, I scale it to 8-bit, I retile it to the binary grid, and then I store that tile on disk for further use. So the first time it'll be slower, but the next time it'll be faster. So now when I have seven uh, projectors and the data moves slowly, that tile will be requested once stored and then used by the other projectors that happen to need that one tile from the server side without having to do the computation. It's already on disk. Uh, the ESRI tile for bundle format, it's ideal because it's smaller chunks so that each piece goes into a file that's named based on the location and um, it doesn't have a global index. So the index is included in each and every piece, um, which makes it really easy to manage because you can just go around and nuke the older files, for example, and they'll just be recomputed. So it's a fairly low value. It's, it's basically just like an, uh, a server cache. It's a, it's a CDN, cache delivery network uh, cache that has a fairly small value. So if I want to scale this and I want to have more servers, it's not, a, it's not an issue that one server has one tile in the cache and the other one has a different tile because they're, they're pretty fast to compute. The whole point is that once they're computed, once they'll be stored, so if that same request happens again, which is very likely because it's filed, that tile is already in the output ready to go. To do this ahead of time, again, the input is 20 terabytes. The output would be even bigger because I just scale it up to make it binary grid. So the output would be massive. I don't want to do that. It would take a long time and it would take a lot of storage space, which again, it's expensive. This way I can use ATSE and do everything on the fly and then slap um, the eCache module on the end and do caching server side. It's not client side, it's server side. Um, so it, it greatly reduces the CPU requirement. It cuts the peaks on the CPU usage. So with a, with a tiny little machine with one or two virtual CPUs, I can support a fairly large user base. It's not perfect, but it's better than anything else. So this is the same thing. It's, it describes the raster. It says it's the same as before, same page size. It has to declare the, <clears throat> the maximum tile size to know how to uh, store the data. And then the data path is the local path in which the cache gets built. If this is present, then um, it, it's a caching module. You can also use the eCache as a source, so the data could be already on disk and it could be just served. Obviously, it doesn't need to do a dynamic request from a source. That is handled by the Apache configuration. So that's pretty much all there is. So behind 
the applications that I showed, like this, the high-rise data, which is this colorized brownish data set here, all those modules are stacked. This is basically the architecture of the Astro server. High-rise that we talked about is this stack, this vertical stack. So on top, you have the internet, basically, and at the bottom, you have the raw data files. They're stored on S3. Uh, there's an SSD cache, and there's also a local indexes for where the files are on S3. So this is what we talked about. Um, the high-rise is 10-bit with a Zen mask is split and canned, and it's on S3. Then we convert it to 8-bit. Oops, didn't mean to click. Convert it to 8-bit, then it's uh, reprojected, retiled, aligned to the binary grid, and then on top is cached, basically. So this top level is cached, e -cache. So it's you can choose the color. Um, so you can see different data sets need different, different processing. Some of them are ready to go, like the CTX would be here. CTX also uses the JPEG with a mask so that it takes less space. So it needs to be converted to PNG, but it's already aligned with the grid. So the, the reproject is missing. That makes it faster. I can still cache it because I want to eliminate PNG creation. It's pretty slow. So I want to eliminate the need to rebuild the PNG once I build it once, so I cache that too. Uh, some others are already aligned and they don't need caching because I don't do anything to them. I just convert them to JPNG on the fly and the demand is lower. Uh, so this is this is basically the data flows from the bottom to the top. And each one of those modules has a web accessible entry point. So I can actually still access the 10-bit data or the un Re realigned, right? So I can access the data at the native resolution while I'm still accessing this by going to a different URL. And that's very important. Like with GDOL, I can actually access all of these. With a web browser, I need to access at this level without the caching or on top with the caching. So different application, I can actually offer different services with, for different users from the same data set. In this case, the high rise is, is uh, glossy, it's JPEG. But imagine this could be lossless, but I don't want to say serve lossless to everybody because uh, the bandwidth would be too huge. So I can convert it to something like JPEG on the fly and offer both lossless and lossy from the same data set with basically zero effort. I never store anything. All right, so this is how everything is put together. Um, it basically says that here's the directory, it's RJS REST services on Mars high rise. And then for each module we have um, let's see, the first two here are the protocol handling. So I'm using the send file if match module, then I'm saying send this file called highrise.json when the request looks like this. And the type is application JSONP, which does the JSON, I don't remember what that is, basically the JSON callback protocol to uh, allow um, access. And then the top one is basically just a basic redirect that says if it comes to the to this URL, just go to the the JSON. That describes the so the JSON file here is the Esri REST protocol file that describes the service itself and allows the clients to connect. Um, then we have the stack before, right? So this is in the opposite order to make it make it really easier. So the first module is MRF. It responds to requests that look like this. So this is the outset pattern. So it's raw tile. Uh, a digit between zero and whatever, it's an integer. So this is the level, row, and column. Um, this is kind of how security of the URLs is, is uh, handled. Uh, you can make the regex really, really tight and get the module to activate only on the proper requests. Um, Lucian, uh, we've got about uh, a minute or two left, and there were some questions in chat uh, if you were willing to take those real quick. Sure, I actually don't have that much more. OK. Uh, this, this one was optional, basically just colorizing it. So let's go oh, yeah. colorizing. <clears throat> so basically, it's the same thing. So you can actually follow that. Um, for example, convert takes the source from the raw, which is the one above, right? So this one takes the source from this, and this one takes the source from, from that, and this one takes the source from that, right? So it just data flows. And that's how it works. All right, so what's the question? Let me see. 
Uh, George had one about uh, why not rescale and retile in advance and just you know have the data set ready for web display. Um, it's basically storage and time and CPU. Right, so of course you can, mm -hmm. um, but doing that would mean computing everything ahead of time. And it's, in most cases, it's just a waste of time because, uh, yes, you could if you wouldn't have Atze, but it's very easy to configure Atze to do it for you on the fly, and then you don't need to worry about it. And then again, if an application needs a slightly different grid or a, needs Web Mercator because it needs to be compatible with Google Maps, you can do that on the fly, right? So converting from GCS to Web Mercator, yeah, it's not a big deal, but if your data size is in the terabyte scale, that will take time and money and storage and service. Nick also has a question about mod retile. If he wants to support a different projection, uh, would he have to add a module for that? Or is it something that he has to hack with mod retile? Or is it maybe just a configuration option? Uh, no, it's not a configuration option. So again, those are hand-tuned projections. In theory, you can do it any way you want. Um, but yeah, you would, you would have to add your own simple module for that, or you can hack the mod retile. Uh, I'm actually working, there's a project that's on the works that that is a, a CGI, a classic CGI. So it's no longer an HTTP module, it's a CGI. It takes the whole thing out of Apache and then it links it with, uh, with GDAL. So you can actually use GDAL to do everything that GDAL does uh, on, the, on the input and on the output and then do it that way. So if you wanna, if you feel more comfortable using GDAL to do your own operation, you can do that. GDAL comes with its own projection engine so you can do all sorts of crazy stuff, right? Including conversions between vectors and rasters and vice versa. But yes, sounds, mod retail sounds like very kitchen sink, but right now it only does those uh, projections and read reading. So it's not really that big currently. Uh, I, I do get the point that it sounds like a big kitchen sink in theory. By definition, it takes multiple inputs for a single file so you can do anything you want. Yes, that's true, but you would need to hack it and add it yourself. Well, I, I look forward to hearing about uh, mod underscore GDAL next year. Uh, that would be... Yeah, uh, it's not a module. It's actually a CGI. Oh, C CGI, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's a fast CGI. It's 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 very different class. I'm not even sure if I can call it part of Atze, right? Because it's it's such a different architecture. Cool. But it allows you to do things like uh, WMS, right? Dynamic file colorization, anything you want, without having to write C, C++ code in Apache. Right? You write it separately in GDAL. Cool. Well, that's making me think of uh, Map Server. So uh, you'd have to go check what that project does. Anyhow, um, I think that's most of our time for today. So uh, thank you very much.